So um, thank you guys so much for, for joining me today. I'm gonna try really hard not to stand in front of my slides. I'm really good at that, so I'm gonna like try to move over here. Um, so I'm gonna be talking with you today about how we can make the products that we build more useful, more usable, and more desire desirable for the target audience that needs to use them. So I want to give you some context about my background because I'm going to be sharing a lot of projects um, and you know examples from projects that I've worked on. So I think it makes sense to talk a little bit about what I've done recently throughout my career. A few years ago, I worked for an agency called Happy Cog, which has an office in uh, Center City, Philadelphia, where I'm from. Um, and Happy Cog is a very well-known web design agency. I worked on all sorts of uh, projects there: uh, university redesigns, large nonprofits, um, energy sector stuff, like all sorts of stuff. So I was there for about two and a half years. And then I went over to AWeber, who is an email marketing provider. So is anybody here familiar with AWeber by chance? So a few of you. So if you're not familiar with AWeber, just by show of hands, have you ever heard of MailChimp or Constant Contact? OK, so lots of folks. So AWeber is an email marketing provider similar to MailChimp and Constant Contact. And I'm a UX team of one there. And uh, what I do is I try to improve the, us the user experience of the product for the customer. So when I say customer or user with AWeber, I mean the person who uses our tool to send email out to their subscribers. I also want to plug AWeber a little bit. Um, I know we're in Philadelphia, which isn't too close to State College, but there are lots of perks to working there. Uh, we have lunch provided at no out-of-pocket cost, and there's a full kitchen on site, and it's restaurant-quality food. We have three chefs that make our lunch for us every day. It's pretty rad. I can't complain about that. Any open positions? Yes, if you go to aweber.jobs. Yep. And we're in the Philadelphia area. We're also nicknamed the Google of Philadelphia because we have slides that go from the second floor to the first floor. It's a LEED certified building. Um, so it's a really cool place to work. I just kind of wanted to plug like how awesome it is, not to make you guys feel bad. Um, but it is a pretty cool place to work. So on to the topic today. What is user experience? So if you're not too familiar with user experience um, and you're looking for a, a kind of a high level definition, Wikipedia defines it as how someone feels about using a product or a service. So you could have an experience with something that is really positive, really productive, uh, really beneficial to you, or you could have a really negative, um, kind of frustrating experience, right? Or maybe somewhere in between. It's almost like a spectrum. So I'm going to show you an example of people having a bad experience with something. Now this is a series of, of clips from a movie that I think you'll recognize. Why does it say pepper jam when there is no pepper jam? I swear to God, I, one of these days I, I, I just kick this piece of shit out the window. You and me both, man. The thing is lucky I'm not armed. Piece of shit. The point of the exercise is that you're supposed to figure out what you would want to do. If... PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? Hmm. Yeah. That's it. That's exactly what I need. Uh -huh. Give it to me. Come on, you little fucker. Let's go. That's what I need. Let's do that. Let's do exactly that, you little fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you're not offended by cursing, by the way, because I'm not. Um, what movie is this? Anybody? Office. office Space. So almost in unison, we all said Office Space. Is there someone here who's never seen Office Space? There's always somebody. Please do yourselves a favor. OK, there's two. There's some people who are like, I've never seen it. Please do yourself a favor and Netflix it, because it's an awesome movie. So there's this recurring theme throughout the movie, right? Most of you have seen it, where the printer just is not working the way it's intended to. It tells you there's a paper jam when there is no paper jam. It gives you error messages that make absolutely no sense, like PC load letter. That's one of the error messages. No human being is supposed to know what that means, right? It just makes no sense. So as a UX designer, I strive, whether I'm designing a printer or a website or whatever it is, for um, my target audience not to have this experience. However, I want to talk about a positive experience that I had that I thought was exceptionally well executed. And it happened to take place offline, much like the printer example. So my mom, about a year and a half ago, had to have some pretty serious surgery. She had to have a tumor removed uh, from a, a um, hospital in Camden, New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia, where I live. So my family and I, the rest of my family, my dad, my siblings, we took a day off from work and we went to the hospital to wait there while she had her surgery. This was the waiting area for um, patients who were having, uh, I guess, uh, cancer surgery. So it was a very specialized uh, waiting area. 
And one of the first things that I noticed about it was not only that it was clean and newly renovated, but it was very spacious and loosely partitioned into areas where families could congregate. So it almost gave you a sense of privacy and place, even though it was not a private context at all. But I thought that was uh, very well done and very strategically um, done. Also, there, as you are probably familiar, there are a lot of regulations um, that the healthcare industry has to comply with, HIPAA regulations about privacy. So another interesting thing that I saw was uh, this screen was in the waiting area. I quickly tried to take a picture while the receptionists were looking. Um, so there's a screen in the waiting area and they assign all the patients in surgery that day a number. And next to that number is the status of the surgery. So you can see whether they're pre-op, in surgery, or post-op. And they gave us a number and they said, you know, if you ever wanna know what's going on with your mom's surgery, just walk up and look for her number and it'll tell you what's going on. That was really helpful because it was serious surgery and they told us it would take two to five hours. So that's a pretty big window, right? And you can imagine getting really concerned after about four and a half hours if you don't know what's going on. At least this gives you some context. If you've ever been to a restaurant chain like the Olive Garden and you have to wait for a table, they give you something like this, right? The hospital gave us something very similar. It was a buzzer. That way we could leave the waiting area to use the restroom or go to the cafeteria downstairs and know that they could reach us if they needed to. So if the surgery were done and the surgeon needed to debrief us, they could get in touch with us even if we weren't in the waiting area. There are also some really nice uh, private meeting rooms where you could meet with the surgeon and you didn't have to like kind of huddle in a hallway or find a private place, right? So you can meet with the surgeon to debrief about the surgery. Luckily, my mom's surgery went really well and she's doing much better now. Um, and at the end of the day, my sister made a comment about this and she said, it feels like they really planned this out this whole like waiting around thing for mom. And I said, yeah, they did. Not only is it good planning, but it's good design. And I can guarantee you that it didn't happen by accident. Whoever plans this experience, I don't know what their title is or you know, what their role is at Cooper Hospital, but I just wanna take them out for a beer and be like, tell me about this process because they did an amazing job. They understood, they put themselves in the shoes of the user. The visitor who's having some, a loved one go in for serious surgery and all the pain points that that visitor might encounter and all the problems that might arise in that visitation experience. But they took all of this into account and designed against it and executed very effectively. And they made a very good experience out of something that could have been a very negative experience. So that's what I strive for as a user experience designer. I want everybody who's using my product to have as productive of an experience as I had that day. So the framework of today's talk is useful, usable, and desirable. This is a phrase that was coined back in the 90s by Liz Sanders. And to quickly define each piece of the trifecta, if something's useful, that means it's needed. It's solving a problem for some user or customer out there, right? It's serving a purpose. If your product doesn't help somebody do something, then there's probably no use for your product and it probably shouldn't exist. Useful and usable are often used interchangeably, but they actually mean different things. If something's usable, that means it's understandable. Your target audience can begin interacting with it without having to figure it out, without having to think too hard. The language in the tool speaks their language, so it uses labels that make sense to them. No PC load letter, right? And on top of that is desirable. I like to think as desirable as the icing on the cake. Um, so if you can get it to be useful and you can get it to be usable, you, want, you would also want it to be enjoyable and desirable, right? And that's kind of where the, the third element comes in. So I want to talk a bit about useful, the first of the trifecta. Jeremy Keith gave the opening keynote this morning, and I saw him last night at the happy hour thing, and I said, oh, Jeremy, I quote you in, um, in my talk tomorrow where you said solve real problems. And Jeremy said, hmm, I'm trying to remember what I was referring to. And then after a few minutes, we realized that he was referring to the W3C's HTML design principles. So I saw him um, give a talk a few years ago at a, a conference called An Event Apart, and he was referring to an HTML design principle that says solve real problems, right? But you can easily apply this to user experience. As UX designers or as product designers, we wanna make sure that our tool has a purpose. Everybody knows the segue, right? And anybody um, ever ridden the segue? Just by show of hands, just like a few of you, you're like, yeah, I've ridden one. Um, <laughs> I see them all the time. I live in Philadelphia uh, near the art museum and there are a lot of tourists. I see tours and stuff going around. So when the Segway, um, I guess before it came out to the market, there was a lot of anticipation about it. And it was supposed to be this kind of like revolutionary new product that would change the way that we move around urban spaces. 
Um, and unfortunately, it kind of landed with a counter-revolutionary thud, to quote Erica Hall. Um, what it does is it doesn't solve a lot of problems, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not, at the end of the day, it's not a very useful tool. And that's because, uh, first and foremost, it doesn't reduce foot traffic congestion. If you think of a crowded urban space, or even an urban space that's not too crowded, um, it's big and clunky. If you imagine a bunch of people walking along and here comes a Segway, it's just gonna kind of make things worse and muck things up. It's not very useful in the rain. Can't really use an umbrella with it. It doesn't uh, help people exercise. It doesn't he help people get active, because you're standing on it, right? So you're not really burning any calories. Doesn't do well with stairs, I imagine. Doesn't go up curbs. And it's also not very affordable. It costs, uh, I think, between two and $5,000 to purchase one brand new, from what I found. It's great for tourists, though. So it does have a niche purpose, but it was kind of hailed at this thing that was gonna change the way that we move around spaces. But at the end of the day, it's just not a very useful product. And I suppose it found its niche, but it wasn't what it was made out to be. It wasn't what it was hyped up to be when it first came to the market. There's another product that never made it to market. This is a concept called the Flizz. Um, it's kind of like a bike, but not really. And I'll, I'll show you a, a demo video, which should give you an idea of how it works. idea, right? I, uh, I hear, usually I hear people laughing pretty hard when I, sh uh, the first time I played this at a conference, everyone was roaring in the audience, and I'm just like, I'm up here like trying not to laugh too hard. Um, so it was never really released to market, like I said. Um, but um, and by the way, um, I found this on, the, on, a, on a website called Tree Hugger about two years ago, and there were a bunch of comments on the page, and one of the, one of the comments was like, obviously a guy wrote it, because he's like, my balls hurt just looking at that thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a woman, and it doesn't look very comfortable. So this is a very leading question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why is the flizz not very useful? Doesn't solve any existing issues? OK. Any, anything, any specific comments? It looks ridiculous, OK. Not comfortable? What if you fall? What if you fall? Yep, great question. You're stuck to it, right? Why so many also like design for the design sake? Innovation for innovation sake? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Innovation. innovation for innovation sake. Um, innovation for innovation sake. Exactly. Right, it doesn't solve any problems that a bicycle doesn't already solve. In fact, it actually does less than what a bicycle does. Imagine that you had a backpack or a purse with you. What are you supposed to do with it? Um, also, how is your head protected? Um, it's not really, and your neck is and you're, you're kind of the, surrounded by those bars. I do give it credit for, again, you know, research and development, kind of experimentation. You have to give credit where credit's due. But at the end of the day, I'm not really sure what type of problems that they were trying to solve um, or how they were going to solve them in a way that a bicycle doesn't already solve them. So here's the question. Does the website not say what problems it's trying to solve? No, it was just kind of like, here's the flizz, and it's a, it's a different take on the bicycle. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another presentation that I give about gender and design. And this is one of the things that I talk about. Um, so but before I go any further, I'd like to, by a show of hands, ask you guys uh, which one of these items you think was designed with a woman in mind. <laughs> so by a show of hands, how many would say the one on the left was designed with a woman in mind? How many, most of you, so how many would say the one on the right was designed with a woman in mind? I think like three of you. Well, it's a trick question. They were both designed with a woman in mind, but the one on the right was um, designed much more effectively. So the one on the left, at some point, um, somebody decided that they wanted women to buy a tool set so that they were, they were gonna take a standard flimsy tool set, make it pink, and then somehow I guess that was gonna work and women were gonna buy it. Whereas if you consider the drill on the right, that's actually a drill designed to work for both men and women. Um, and it's not, pink or anything like that, but actually some really um, smart design decisions went into the design of the drill. 
So it tends to weigh a little bit less than other drills because women um, have, tend to have less upper body strength than men. So that way when they're using it, they'll be less likely to fatigue or they just won't fatigue as quickly. The grip is also smaller because women have smaller hands. So these design considerations make the tool uh, very useful for women who are actually engaged in home repair. So big box retailers and uh, you know, tool manufacturers, if you will, they know um, research shows that more and more women are making primary household decisions now. Um, financial decisions, home repair decisions. And not only are they making the decisions, but they're actually engaging in the home repair process. They're taking classes on how to hang drywall, they're painting and you know, um, sanding and all that kind of stuff. So you know, if you're in that field, I guess the home repair-ish field, if you will, you know that it's important for your products to be useful for women. So whoever made the design decisions that went into the product on the right, I also want to take them out and buy them a beer and talk to them about that process because it's much more effective and useful for the target audience, women, than the product on the left. So to make products useful, like I said, we need to understand the needs of our audience, right? It's very often we just run with assumptions, right? We make assumptions about who our audience is, what they need, or we just kind of channel our own needs and biases into that of the target audience. But there's a mantra in user experience that you are not your user, right? Um, so making assumptions or projecting your own needs and biases onto your target audience can be very dangerous. A great example of that can be found in the auto industry. So BMW is a German manufacturer, um, and apparently in Germany, uh, con consumers, uh, the folks who buy cars in Germany, don't care about cup holders. Not the same in the United States. But German engineers refused to put cup holders in their car um, for various reasons, I think for aesthetic reasons, or they just didn't believe that it was necessary. So what was happening was um, Americans were walking into dealerships, BMW dealerships, test driving the cars, realizing that there was no place to put their morning cup of coffee, and leaving, and walking away from a thirty to $60,000 purchase because there was no place to put their cup of coffee. And it sounds crazy, like why would somebody not buy a car because of that? But it's something that's very important to people. And you think about it, they're driving this car to work probably Monday through Friday every day, and they need their coffee first thing in the morning. They need somewhere to put their coffee. And if they don't have that, they're not going to buy the car. So what BMW did was they kind of reacted with post-production cup holders. So you can see it here. They kind of tacked it on to the side of the console. Um, it's very in the way. Um, I've read, uh, there's like a, there's a forum of people complaining about everything. It's amazing. And I found a, p a forum of BMW owners complaining about their BMWs and talking about um, passengers getting into uh, that side of the car and the left knee banging into the cup holder. And now you have a bruised knee. And if after a while, if you bump into it enough, it'll break off. And that only that, not only that, it's only one cup holder. So what if you're a passenger? What if you both have a cup of coffee you're like fighting over the cup holder, you know? So um, unfortunately, they didn't take into account the needs of the audience from the beginning. And if they had, they could have engineered or designed the cup holder into the interior of the car and put it in a much more uh, strategic place and put it in a much more natural location. And right now, they find themselves reacting to a problem. And we encounter this in software all the time. How many of you have ever been in a situation like this where you're reacting to a problem and trying to fix your site because you, you didn't realize up front what, some, what your audience needed? It happens all the time. I've seen it happen a lot. Anybody here familiar with Boo.com? It's one of the notorious, uh, I don't see anybody, uh, any hands or anything. It's one of the notorious um, dot com era websites. So this website was live from 1998 to the year 2000. And from what I've read, from what I've gathered, it looks like about $180 million was invested into this website back in the late 90s. $180 million. That's a lot of money. So um, for its time, it was very cutting edge. It was very stunningly beautiful. When you think about 1998, seeing a website like this, it was actually really impressive. And what the, what the team did, I guess, you know, they had a lot of money to burn. So they built um, a state-of-the-art website with cutting edge technology at the time. Those technologies included Flash and JavaScript. And, um, and they just kind of ran with it. And they built this beautiful whiz-bang website. But I'd like you to step back, kind of like think back to whatever machine you had in 1998. 99, 2000. Um, and think about, first of all, what kind of internet connection did you have back then? <laughs> Dial-up, Dial right? So these pages were incredibly bloated and incredibly heavy due to the, the latest technologies at the time that they were using. Also, think about the browser that you were using, 98, 99, 2000. Probably didn't support Flash. Maybe it did if you were lucky. Probably didn't support JavaScript. So they had built this beautiful website that worked really well on their machines and with their connection but it didn't work for a decent chunk of the audience. 
So people would come to this website trying to buy clothes or browse and look at jewelry. And if they happened to have Flash and JavaScript installed, they would have to wait like a few minutes for each page to, to load. So it was pretty painful to use. And that was one of the major reasons why the site um, kind of went down and why the business closed in the year 2000, just because they didn't have the target, the needs of the target audience in mind. They were building for themselves and not thinking about the audience's context. So the best way to design for your users is to find out what people need from your product. Um, what are their needs so you can meet their needs? Now there are some naysayers. Anybody know who this is? Anybody? Henry Ford, Henry Ford. okay. I saw, I heard like some murmuring. Um, but what Henry Ford famously said was if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And I kind of disagree with this. I, um, if you really read into it, he's right. I think you know what a lot of people interpret this as is as um, you know you, you shouldn't talk to your audience because they're not going to tell you anything useful, right? And I agree with that if you ask the wrong questions. So if you ask people what they want, they're going to start suggesting design su design you know implementations. Do you ever talk to a non-designer about how they should design something? It's really hilarious. Like you know like oh like you should make this bright yellow so that I'll see it, and you should put a border around this, and these buttons should be green. They should not be yellow. They should be green. You know, they're just going to start to give you ridiculous feedback. Um, so if you ask people what they want or what they think something should be, they're not going to give you valuable input. But people can tell you, can articulate quite a bit about what their needs are, what their pain points are, and what they're struggling with. Maybe they're using a comp competitor product and it's not meeting their needs. They can really articulate that if you know how to ask the right questions. And that's what user research is. So an example um, of the, something that I learned uh, through user research conducted at Aweber, where I'm at now, is, um, well, first of all, to give you guys some context, um, I'm the first dedicated UX designer at Aweber. So they did some light UX design before they hired me, but they had never done um, immersive user research studies or anything like that. So they had this existing product, and I came on board and I started to conduct interviews and other types of research with our customers. And um, one thing that I learned is some interesting, interesting things about our email message editor. So this is a screenshot of part, of part of our editor where you can build your emails. And this is one of the templates that we provide you. So you can see how it's like a spring theme template. Um, it's got flowers on it and a nice like papery background and all sorts of modules where you can put in various pieces of content. Aweber, uh, the team at Aweber, they thought for a long time, you know, we want to build, um, we want to design these beautiful templates because we want to give our customers an array of templates to choose from, all sorts of theme templates. So we want them, we want them to have beautiful templates to send out beautiful emails. Makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you know, it kind of on the surface level, like you know, without digging into it and verifying it, it sounds like it would make sense. Like, who wouldn't want a nice email template to send emails with? So there's that, and you think about the editor, and there's all sorts of templates in there, like kind of like this style. Um, and then you look at the types of emails that our customers send. This is a very typical email that our one of our customers sent. Now it looks like she just wrote it in Gmail, right? But she actually sent it through our tool. And what we learned about our customers um, once I started doing you know, a lot of user research is that they're small business owners, but they tend to be solopreneurs. So coaches, consultants, that kind of thing. So they're a team of one. They don't work for a big company. They work for themselves. And they tell me things all the time like, you know, your templates are too corporate. Your templates are too fancy. When I send someone an email, I want, it, I want them to look like they're getting an email from me. I don't want them to look like they're getting an email from a big corporation. So your templates don't work for me. Here's another template that we have. All these nice illustrations of like buildings and like a dark sky in the background and then there's text on the bottom where you can start typing. But most of our customers don't need that. And to add to that, to support this type of template, we added this robust drag and drop functionality at the top. So you can drag in like different pieces of the email and e HTML email is still based on tables. So essentially what it does is it's like kind of building out little table blocks for you and you know, allowing you to build this really nice like customized layout. But unfortunately, what the team did is they didn't have, before I started, they didn't have a really firm understanding of the expectations and the needs of our users, and they over-engineered this big time. So we have all this functionality and all these templates that the vast majority of our customers don't use. So this is just a great example of how understanding your customers is critical. And fortunately, the customers that do use it for simple emails can still use it, um, but we spent a lot of time and money and energy into engineering something that wasn't useful for the vast majority of our customers. If you want to learn more about user research, um, check out this book, or I guess interview, user interviews. Check out Interviewing Users by Steve Portigal. Great book. I read it last year. 
There's also this book, Just Enough Research. I'd probably recommend that one first. You should probably like switch the order of these. Um, but it's actually written for people who work in this industry who are interested in conducting user research and don't know anything about it. It's very concise and packed with a lot of good information. So if you're interested in learning how to do user research, I highly recommend this book. So we talked a lot about making things useful. Now I'm gonna talk about usable. When I was at Happy Cog, Kaplan Test Prep was one of our clients. Has anybody here ever taken a, a you know, standardized exam, like a SATs, like grad school exam, anything like that? So Kaplan Test Prep will prep you for any standardized tests like you can think of on the planet. SAT, med school exams, uh, you know, passing the bar, like any you know, uh, law school entry exam. All sorts of exams they'll prep you for. So Happy Cog redesigned their site. And this is uh, what the LSAT section of the site looked like prior to the redesign. Now, when I was, still, I was still working there, I was working on this project, and we had a small budget for usability testing. We didn't have a huge budget, but we were able to test with a few people, and we got a, really, we got a lot of great information out of it. One of the things that we noticed during the usability tests is that nobody was going to the blog. We knew, from our perspective, we thought Kaplan had some really good content on their blog, and it was free content, but we noticed during the usability tests that nobody was going to it. So we started asking people during the test, did you happen to notice that there's a blog? And they would say, well, yeah, but I, well, I don't know why I would click on that. And we would say, well, what do you mean? And they'd say, well, it just says blog. Every company, every website has a blog. Why would I go to their blog? So we said to them, well, why don't you click on it and take a look at what's there and let us know kind of what you think. So that's what they did, and this is what they would see. And as they looked through it, they said, wow, this is actually really useful information. This is the type of information that I've been looking for because I've been thinking about how to prepare for the LSAT, and I've been Googling for like, free tips and stuff, and this is all really good stuff. And they said, but I would never have known to go, to go here because all it says is blog. <coughs> that was really useful for us to know. We told, we told our client, like, hey, you have some really great content on your blog. That's the good news. The bad news is that people aren't getting to it because it's hidden behind that blog link, and it wasn't surfaced anywhere else throughout the experience. So it was very valuable for us to know. So right around the time that I was working on the Kaplan project is when I left Happy Cog, and then I went to A. Weber. One of the first things I noticed about A. Weber is this. And I was like, oh my god, this is so cosmic, right? And I was just like, I wonder if our customers are having the same problem that Kaplan's audience was. And to make matters worse, if you're a current customer with A. Weber and you sign into your account, the, the link completely goes away. It's no longer accessible. Right, And usability testing showed that, sure enough, our customers were having the same issue. Um, the blog content, the, we do have some useful content on there, but a lot of them just don't know that, is, that it exists. So that's another problem that we're aware of at AWeber, and we're currently investigating on how to improve that. So as UX designers, we work to reduce barriers to entry. Like you could, you could think of the blog link as a barrier to entry because it's one small gateway into a world of blog content, right? That a lot of people just don't see and don't think to go to. There are tons and tons of barriers to entry when it comes to e-commerce um, checkout, like online shopping carts and stuff. Unfortunately, this happens all the time, even though the last thing that you want people to experience while they're trying to buy something from you is a usability problem. But it happens a lot. Google Analytics put out a great video a few years ago about um, a guy at a store having like, the same frustrations that a lot of people have online when they're trying to buy something, only it's happening in a brick and mortar store. I think it'll make sense when you see it. Hey, just that, thanks. You sure? Uh, yeah. Username? Oh, uh, Nick M? No. And M1983? No. I, uh, Zandy Pops? Sorry. <coughs> Zandy Pops? No, okay, don't worry, I'll help. What's your postcode? Oh, it's a GU749ZT. Welcome back, Nick Forever. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please listen carefully to this bread license agreement before continuing with your purchase of a loaf of bread. If you do not, blah, blah, blah. You also agree not to use any bread-based products for any purposes prohibited by United Kingdom law, including without limitation design, development, <laughs> manufacture of missiles, chemical, nuclear, or biological weapons. Tick. I'm afraid you've timed out. What? Sorry. Hello? Excuse me. Oh, yeah, hey. Just one loaf, sir. Yeah, we just... What's your username? Uh, it's uh, Nick Forever, but number four, not the... Gotcha. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to check that you're a real person. Could you say that for me? <laughs> it's not even a word. OK, how about this one? You know what, forget it. You, you, All this one? Uh, 
hippopotamice. You're in. Great, I'm in. £8.85. It's supposed to be 98 pence. Plus express delivery. What's that? Oh, well, it's express delivery. It's fast. So there's, um... <laughs> standard. Oh, standard. Standard delivery. That's £4.99. Why? Bread insurance. You didn't untick the don't decline bread insurance option. You know what? I think I'll risk it. It is quite close to the sell-by date. Don't care. 98 pence it is. If you want to pop back in five business days, it'll be ready for your collection. Well, well I need it now, obviously. Oh, OK. Uh, you want the take-home-today price? Well, that's £3.27. You know what, I'm going to go. Come back soon. I won't. <laughs> that guy really, like, held out, right? He was there, like, I feel like way longer than I would have been. Um, you know, it's, 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 obviously it's like satire or whatever, but it's, it's, people experience this all the time on the web, all the time. And it's my job to do everything that I can to prevent this from happening. So we talked about useful and you making things usable. Um, now we're going to talk about desirable. So you can think about it as adding a layer of delight to the experience that you make useful and usable. Aaron Walter wrote a book called Designing for Emotion, and he said, we've been designing usable interfaces, which is like a chef cooking edible food. So there's so much more we can do with the products that we make than just by making them useful and usable. Google's been doing this for years um, with the Google Doodle. You know, they've been doing all sorts of cute little fun stuff, the I'm feeling lucky button for a long time. Um, I have a Tumblr site, which I never use, but recently I went in to post something and uh, I had to agree to the terms of service. And I read the top and I thought it was really funny. It says, politics, religion, people sure do have a hard time agreeing these days. Well, here's something that everyone can agree to, our updated terms of service. So I thought that was really clever. It was a nice way of adding a moment of delight to um, kind of a pain point or a, you know, an interruption of having to agree to the terms of service. Anybody here ever flown Virgin, uh, Virgin Airlines? So I see a couple hands going up. Um, it's a fantastic flying experience. Um, I try to, if you fly a lot or if you have the option to fly, um, look into Virgin because it's awesome. To the point where you see people thanking Virgin Airlines on Twitter for the wonderful flying experience that they've had. Now it's pretty rare that somebody tweets at an airline for a good reason. It's usually for a bad reason, like, you know, F you, you just lost my luggage, that kind of thing. But people were actually treating, um, you know, tweeting at Virgin Airlines for positive reasons. This is actually what the plane looks like when you board. It's pretty cool, right? Lots of like cool purple lighting. And there are the screens on the, um, the back of the, ch the seats you can use to like order drinks and order food and whatnot. So it, it's pretty cool. Um, though by law, they're also required to tell you uh, safety information. And they have a really cute like little safety video that they play for you at the beginning of the flight. I'll go ahead and uh, share that with you. Please keep your seat belt fastened whenever the seat belt light is on. To be safe, we recommend your seat belt stays fastened whenever you're in your seat, just in case there is unexpected turbulence. And please comply with instructions from the in-flight team with regard to the fastened seat belt signs. For the point zero 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 one percent of you who have never operated a seat belt before, it works like this. Just insert the metal end into the buckle until it clicks and pull on the loose end to tighten. To open, lift on the top of the buckle. Be sure the seat belt fits low and tight across your lap, and you're good to go. <laughs> so that's, that's their actual safety instruction video that you watch on the flight. And I fly a lot, and it's never this fun. So if you get a chance to fly Virgin Airlines, please do. And the, what I love about this is that it meets all the regulatory requirements, but it goes above and beyond to entertain you, right? And by entertaining you, they're probably actually, actually getting you to pay more attention to the safety information than they would otherwise. When I was at Happy Cog, we also redid um, Club Nintendo's website. So Club Nintendo is uh, Nintendo's reward, rewards program. I was not the lead designer on this project. I, may, I worked maybe 10 or 20 hours on the project. Um, but there was so much opportunity to add a layer of delight here. I mean, it's kind of hard to make it boring, right? You have Yoshi, you have Mario, and you have all this other stuff. So Jeremy this morning in the opening keynote talked about progressive enhancement. The team at Happy Cog um, used progressive enhancement to put in like little Easter eggs and little extra moments of delight, depending on the device you were using, whether or not that the device supported that, uh, that interaction. So if you were uh, using this, uh, using this UI with like a, you know, a desktop or a laptop or whatever with a mouse, and you hovered over this button, a little coin would pop up. Now, if you were using a touchscreen device, there's no such thing as hover, right? So you won't see the coin, um, but it's still a really neat experience. It add, you know, if you're using a mouse, it adds a layer of delight, 
if you're using a touch screen, you don't see the coin, but you're still enjoying the rest of the experience. You can also tell an engaging story about your product. Um, people just inherently love to hear stories. People love to be shown rather than, rather than told. Um, people love, you know, just kind of a narrative. Um, and, you know, it has to be for the right purposes. But I think DuckDuckGo did a good job of telling a story about their product. So DuckDuckGo is a search engine. They're actually based um, outside of Philadelphia, though I've never actually met the, uh, the founders in, in person. Um, but um, on, one, on part of their site, they say, DuckDuckGo does not collect or share personal information, and the rest of this page tries to explain why you should care. So that's their thing. Unlike Google, they don't collect any information about your search habits. And this is the story they tell. When you search Google for a term like herpes and click on a link, your search term is sent to that site along with your browser and computer info, which can often uniquely identify you. That's creepy, but those sites also use third-party ads, and those third parties build profiles about you, and that's why those ads follow you everywhere. <laughs> your profile can also be sold, and like in sh you know, show up in credit and background checks, and there's more to that, there's more as well. Remember your searches, like bankruptcy? Google also saves them, and they can come back to uh, bite you and be legally requested, or a bad Google employee could go snooping, or Google could get hacked. And that's why we don't send your searches to other sites or store any personal information at all. That's our privacy policy in a nutshell. And that's why you should use DuckDuckGo. Fantastic story, right? And now you're all sitting here thinking like, wow, I was Googling some stuff last night that I probably shouldn't have been Googling. <laughs> So we talk about making things delightful, making things enjoyable. It can be easy to get carried away. Enough said, <laughs> right? Why did Clippy suck so much? Too intrusive, right. So it was well-intentioned, but poorly executed. It interrupted your flow. Um, it sensed that you were writing a letter and animated outward. And by nature, you just see animations, because that's how our brains are wired. So it just distracts you from what you were trying to do, offering you help when you probably didn't need help. So as long as you're not getting in the way, as long as you're not interrupting the experience by trying to make it too delightful, um, and depending on the nature of your brand too, like if you work in pharmaceuticals, there's probably not much of an opportunity to make things delightful, but maybe there is. It's just something to think about. So as we build products, we want to strive for all three, making them useful, usable, and desirable. John Kolko says a product that touches all three is a rare gem of design. It's very true, it's very hard to make products that are useful, usable, and desirable. We have budget constraints, we have politics that we have to navigate, we have time constraints, we have technical constraints. There are all sorts of things working against us, but we strive to do the best that we can do given the situation that we have. Um, there's a, I have a couple examples of products that I think are fantastic that touch on all three. Uh, Warby Parker, if you're not familiar, um, they provide uh, affordable uh, prescription glasses. And they have a great experience from top to bottom, as far as I'm concerned. The glasses that I'm wearing, I got from Warby Parker in January. Um, they're affordable. They're, most of them cost about $99. Um, and just the whole, the whole experience from, the, you can get a free trial pair of, uh, of frames. So you can pick out the frames you want to try. They mail them to you in a box. You get five at a time. You try them on. You send them back at no cost. Um, the customer service was great. Um, they even have you measure your pupillary distance so that they can properly um, make your lenses, and they have you, like, it's really simple instructions that you can do in, like, five minutes. You hold a credit card up to your uh, webcam under your eye, and it takes a photo, and it's like, all right, done, and then you just kind of, like, send that over to them uh, electronically. It's pretty cool. So they have, like, there's a lot of complicated steps that could be really complicated that aren't, that are actually kind of cool. I was like, wow, this is neat. I'm actually, like, enjoying doing this and like, in front of my webcam. But yeah, I think Warby Parker does a great job of making the entire experience useful, usable, and desirable. I listened to a podcast called Happy Monday, and uh, a couple months ago they interviewed the founder of uh, 12 South, and 12 South makes accessories for Apple products. And the founder talked about how uh, he went to an Apple store at or near a university once, like at one of the, a big university, I can't remember where, and he was talking to the employees about the uh, laptop cases that they sell, and the employees said there's a big problem with theft on campus, and the cases, you know, it's obvious to a thief that if they see a case that there's a laptop in it because the case is very recognizable. So the founder got the idea of creating a case for your MacBook that looks like an old book. So you close it and you zip it up and you leave it sitting out and it just looks like an old book. It's very convincing. It doesn't look like um, you know, a case at all. 
And it's pretty cool. Like it works. It, it protects your. You know, it's useful because it protects your laptop. It's usable because you know all you have to do is unzip it. It's not hard to figure out. Um, and it's desirable because it's like kind of like you know it kind of looks neat to walk around with an old book. I guess if you, if that's kind of your aesthetic. Um, but the founder talked about how he's gotten emails um, from customers who've bought it saying that their house has been burglarized and their MacBook wasn't stolen because it was wrapped up in this book. Another customer told him that they closed up the laptop, like the book book, um, and left it in a coffee shop and forgot to take it home and then went back hours later and it was still sitting there. It was still sitting there on a table because it just looked like an old book. So I thought this was a fantastic example of making something useful, usable, and desirable, really solving a need in a creative way. And here's another view of it. So go forth and do your best to make things useful, usable, and desirable, and may the force be with you. And thank you so much for joining me. I think we're here until 3.20, if anybody has any questions. Honey? Yeah. I do have a question. You mentioned earlier the quote from Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. And I believe there is a difference between what customers or clients want and what they need, right? You mentioned these two. Uh-huh. So how do you put this into the context of your work? What they want and what they need. When working with clients? So the question was, like, how do you work with clients who think that they know what they want, but they don't know what they need? Um, that's really tough. <laughs> it, it depends. I, can't, um, I wish I had like, a general answer for you, um, but I, I, I don't. One thing that you can do, actually, is um, have, people, uh, have your clients observe usability testing and watch, and watch their users fail. If you, know, if you have a client who's not convinced that the site's hard to use, uh, organize a usability test, run the test, and have the client actually observe the test. That's one thing. If your issue is convincing them of, of usability problems. But I mean, it depends. There's all sorts of different techniques you can use. It kind of just depends on what the problem is. Yeah? You mentioned you, you do email marketing for a living. Any pro tips uh, when it comes to great design of an email, maybe versus a typical website that you might not be thinking about? Oh, so the question was, any, any good tips for designing a good email? Um, <laughs> I feel like there's like a joke in UX that we should walk around with a t-shirt that says it depends because the, my answer is always it depends. I think it's a, you know, it depends on what the purpose of your email is. Um, is the purpose of your email to stay on, keep on minds with your uh, subscribers? Um, I have one client who's a, a lawyer and he's an immigration lawyer and he sends out one email a month because he wants to help uh, former clients and prospect clients. Like he wants to send them information about you know, immigration policy and whatnot. But he wants to stay on top of mind. And there's no call to action in the email. It's not like click this button to buy my whatever. He just wants to stay on top of mind so that immigrants tend to know other immigrants who are having immigration issues. And if he, if he gets one referral out, out of sending that email once a month to 30 people, then that pays for a Weber like mul multiple times over. Um, so I think it just depends on what your long-term goals are as a business owner or product owner or whatever and where email fits into that. So yeah, anybody that I haven't called on yet? Yeah. What incentives do you use to get people to do usability testing? Um, you mean you, to get participants in? That's a good question. Um, everybody loves Amazon gift cards, so that's what we use. And you can send them electronically. So you can email them. You don't have to like print anything out, although you could if you wanted to. That's typically, um, that's typically what, what I use or what I try to use. I've used cash before. People also love cash, but I, I'm not comfortable handling cash for lots of reasons, as you can imagine. Um, so I try to avoid cash. I try to avoid something with a paper trail or an electronic paper trail. Um, I've done as little as $40 for an hour for an in-person session, and I've gone up to $150 an hour. It depends on your audience. If you need to recruit doctors and lawyers, they're not going to give you an hour of their time for 40 bucks. But I mean, I've, I've heard of people um, working on pharmaceutical projects. If they have a healthy budget, they'll just give the doctor $200 Amazon gift card or whatever for the hour or $200 check. You can use checks too. Although again, I just, I prefer Amazon gift cards. There's just too many things that can go wrong with cash and checks. Anything else? No? All right, well, thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Really great, Michelle.